Chelsea Pfeffer, um, oops, no, uh, Moshe Varde. Uh, so there has been a change in the schedule. I think uh, people have figured this out. And on to Moshe. Thank you. I'm going to start with some of the some of the surprising quote from given the source. This is quoting Jason Furman, who is chair of the uh, Council of Economic Advisor in the White House, and published uh, in July an article about the opportunities and challenges of artificial intelligence. This is an interesting sentence. He says, "Even though we have made as we have not made as much progress recently on other areas of AI, such as logical reasoning." The advancement in deep learning techniques may ultimately act as at least as a partial substitute for these other areas. So I wish we had invited him to this workshop. <laughs> so a classical problem in computer science is the Boolean satisfiability problem. Right? This is kind of the, if you want the assembly, if we talk about policy databases as assembly language, then these are the, the gates, these are the ultimate transistors of logic. And so the modern uh, way we phrase it is we are given a Boolean expression. We are going to assume that it's already in conjunct normal form, so it's a conjunction of these junctions, of literals, and we're trying to find a satisfying assignment. Now, people have been thinking about these problems for a long time. So we already find in the, in the 19th century William Stanley Givons. William Stanley Givons was a British economist and logician. And he, he should get credit for what we call Boolean algebra, because Boole did not invent Boolean algebra, but Givons. Boole used exclusive or rather than inclusive or. And he already writes, I've, I've given much attention therefore to lessening both the manual and the mental labor of the process. And by process, he means logical Boolean logical reasoning. And I shall describe several devices which may be adopted for saving trouble and risk of mistake. And he builds the first logic machine. He built a machine that can do logical reasoning over four variables. If you're not impressed, try to do it with moving wooden pieces. You see, it's not so trivial. <laughs> and then, this is an amazing quote. This is Ernest Schroeder, a German algebraist. And he writes, getting a handle on the consequences of any premises, or at least the facet method for obtaining these consequences, seems to me to be one of the noblest, if not the ultimate goal of mathematics and logic. Nothing short of that. And of course, we know that ultimately, in the early 70s, Cook and Levine saw the Boolean satisfiability is NP-complete, which kind of explained why we had uh, over a century before that of people not finding really any very fast method for satisfiability. And so, but at the same time, as we have the development in complexity theory, people already, going back to the mid-50s, starting building programs for doing essentially Boolean reasoning. And the first one is due to Newell, Shaw, and Simon. And they wrote a program called Logic Theorist. And they were able to prove about 150 theorems from Principia Mathematica about propositional logic. And they wrote to Russell, and Russell was happy. And the next important paper is Davis and Putnam, Computational Method in Propositional Calculus. It's a technical report to the National Security Agency. Was, was not published. I think today it's available but was not published for many years. But I always made sure I give, give them credit, because I know that they are listening. <laughs> <laughs> and then two important papers, JCM in 1960, and then CSCM 1962, Davis Putnam, and uh, uh, Davis Logman and Loveland. Davis, Davis, where is Martin Davis? He lives in Berkeley? Yeah, it's too bad that he's not here. He lived at the Logic Colloquium a couple of weeks ago. He lives up here. here. OK, so it's a shame. A mile away from you right now. <laughs> it's a shame that he's not here. And, and the DPL the technique, Davis, Patton, Logan, and Loveland became kind of the canonical for satisfiability. And it's a, the basic ideas are, are, are rather simple. Convert it to CNF, use a backtracking search. And there is one heuristic that proved to be effective, which is if you have one clause, remember, clause is a disjunction. So if one clause is a generative disjunction, then that's the one you're trying to satisfy first, rather than uh, making a choice of which variable to satisfy. And by 1990, you know, we were able to solve problems with maybe 100 variables. And if you're not impressed with 100, people say, what do you want? Two to the 100. It's a large number. What do you expect? And then. In the mid-90s, we started a revolution, which is still going on. And today, we, the name has been changed from DPLL to CDCL, Conflict-Driven Clause Learning. 
And people debate what it is. I mean, I would say it's really the, the terminology for modern SAT solver based on these five key ideas. One is back jumping. Back jumping means when you backtrack, don't just go one level at a time, go as high as you can. You save a lot of time by, by jumping up. Uh, unit clause preference. Unit clause preference, preference is, as I said, is the key heuristic. It turns out that when you do profiling of the code, you spend 80% of the time doing unit preference. And so suddenly people realize that this is the thing they need to implement most efficiently. And a naive implementation people used before, which was kind of linear time algorithm for Horan SAT essentially, was not good enough. And people came up with smarter data structures. And then conflict-driven closed learning, you backtrack, you, I mean you go down, you find a conflict, you, you, you block, you don't want to repeat the same mistake again. So you do conflict analysis, you try to identify which part of the assignments are the bad part, and you want to block that, that partial assignment, and you add a new clause. In turn, this new clause really can be obtained for, by resolution from the other uh, methods. And then uh, how to choose variable on which to split. People thought that the goal is to choose the, val the variable to minimize the size of the search tree. And that means you have to choose wisely. But the more wisely you want to choose, the more time it takes to choose it. You know, some people you sit down in a restaurant and they study the menu and they study the menu and they study the menu because they want to choose wisely. Everybody else is done with dinner, they're still choosing. <laughs> and so the idea here is don't spend too much time choosing. Choose reasonably well, but don't worry to be the optimal. And that's kind of a dilemma. Should you be smart or fast? The answer is some very often smart is better than fast. And then restart, which I think, Bart, I think this, you guys are the first one to publish it, if I recall, which is sometimes you just say, you know, you've, you're bogged down in the search. Just, just quit it and restart with some new other random assignments. And everything you have learned so far is still relevant. So these key, five key heuristics and the two important tools, GRASP for Michigan in the mid-90s and then SHAP from Princeton in around 2000. Do any of the heuristics extend to model accounting? Uh, actually, in my opinion, um, not all of them. But the thing that I'm amazed that I have not seen in model counting is, is uh, closed learning, because it's entirely applicable. I don't know why people have not, in fact, uh, put it in, in for closed learning. You have an explanation? Yeah, there's a system, uh, mini CTD, that uses closed learning uh, to compile circuits and the model counting afterwards. So they're CDCL-based knowledge compilation tools. Yeah, but I think kind of the main tool for model counting, for some reason, I have not yet caught up there. I don't co quite know why. And so the amazing thing is today we can solve problems, industrial problems, with millions of variables. And Sanjit Cheshire, here from Berkeley, a few years ago ran this nice experiment. He took 12 years of SAT solvers and ran them on a, on a 2012 machine on one benchmark and showed that on this benchmark, GRASP ran in 800 seconds and the glucose in 2012 took one second. So we see three orders of magnitude improvement roughly over a decade. And it is so impressive, impressive that people talk about Moore's law for SAT solvers. Some f social phenomenon by which we are still continuing to improve in, in such a dramatic fashion. And in fact, amazingly, earlier this year, just in the summer, uh, Don Knuth received the most prestigious award of SIAM, Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. And he gave the von Neumann lecture. And it was about satisfiability. So this is what Knuth is now working with there, but satisfiability. In fact, he's working on volume four. And by now, volume four has many, many sub-volume, or they're called fascicle. I learned a new word. I guess I don't know exactly what fascicle is. It sounds like a face. And uh, fascicle six of volume four is all about satisfiability, which Knuth called the story of satisfiability. is the tale of a triumph of software engineering. I would have called it algorithmic engineering rather than software engineering blended with rich doses of beautiful mathematics. And some of you I've heard uh, a few months ago, we heard in the news a result in mathematics about coloring of, of Pythagorean triples that have been proven using SAT solvers. And the proof is of size 200 terabyte. It's considered the biggest proof in mathematics. And we have today also an industrial application of SAT solving because of this impressive success. Uh, there is a nice CSEM paper from uh, four years ago by Leonardo de Moura and, and Nicola Bjorner explaining how Z3, uh, an advanced SAT solver, is being used in Microsoft for commercial software development. So this is not just an academic pursuit. As we speak now, Microsoft has hundreds of machines running SAT solvers 
for their software development uh, practice. Now, what I'd like to do, this was kind of introduction, I'd like to show you, okay, now that we have this, what can we do with it? And my motivation, original motivation, came up from, I've been working for many years in verification. So verification is about building systems and then trying to ensure whenever you build a system, you have some intention in mind. People call it designer intent. How do we know the system you built actually meet their designer intent? And this is called functional verification. And the estimate today that, that people vary, but somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the design effort is dedicated not to writing code, but to verifying that the code does what it's supposed to do. Now, if you live in academia, you heard a lot of formal verification and uh, model checking, and you are convinced that this is what people do in practice. But uh, I've done some kind of, uh, I would say this is a bit informal, but I've done some probing and polling, okay, asking people, okay, how many people do you have doing verification? How many of them do formal? How many of, how many of them do not do formal? And so it turns out that maybe 10% in some of the advanced places, 10% do formal verification. So what do the rest do? They, they do what you do if you write a program. You, you put some appropriate uh, test and that's how you run your program. Okay, I suspect that very few of you have actually very formally verified the program if, if you write program. I don't mean to offend anybody. <laughs> So this is 90% of the, of, the, of the verification effort. And what you do essentially, and this is, I have to say, this is the standard methodology, and it has not changed for the past, uh, the basic idea has not changed for the past probably 60, 70 years. You run your, your system with different carefully chosen inputs, and for these inputs you, you think you know what the answer should be, and you compare the ideal, the reference answer with the actual answer. And of course, the challenge is that if we have to do it, the, the, the test space is exceedingly large. In fact, take as a simple example, imagine that you want to test a floating point, a floating point divider. And this is an example, of course, it's chosen because about 20 years ago, Intel came up with a, the Pentium, and the Pentium couldn't do proper floating point division. And so if you're dealing with 128 bit numbers, then you want to try all combination, that will be 2 to the 256, and the sun will go nova before you're done. So we need a better approach. And so the approach for many years was that you, you hire smart people, and they're called testers, and what they do, they think hard about the, the system you're building, and they think of all kind of corner cases, and they write tests to test these particular corner cases. What happens if it's one input is, the two, two inputs, one is very large, one is very small, both are very small, both are very large, and things like that. And the conventional wisdom is that writing a test is like writing code. When you write code, the conventional wisdom is a programmer writes about two, 20 lines per day, whatever is the programming language that you are doing. And the same thing is roughly true for test. In fact, about uh, uh, over 25 years ago, I was at IBM, and they built a machine that was called, it's an emulator. Emul emulator is a hardware simulator, and it's about 100,000 times faster than software simulation. So they, built this big, they, they bought this big machine, and uh, it cost about $5 million at a time. And they, for that project, which was a, a disk drive controller, they had about uh, 100 test cases. So these people would write, you can calculate, uh, 2,000 test cases per day, and they would run them on the emulator, and will be done in about one minute. And the rest of the day, 23 hours and 15, 59 minutes, it will sit idle, and somebody was very embarrassed for investing $5 million in a system that's being used one minute per day. And so there was a need to increase the productivity of these people dramatically. And people in IBM Haifa, uh, research in Haifa, came up with a beautiful idea. Don't write test, write constraint that describes scenarios. If you want to say two inputs are very large, write constraints that say these inputs are both very large. And now use a constraint solver to generate many, many solutions. And every solution is another test vector, so to speak. Okay, so this is how you do test generation. And this has become today an NRC standard. That's how you do a functional verification. Now, the question is, how do we get it? What kind of solution do we want? So of course, you have a solver. Let's suppose you, you, you have a solver. You get one of these uh, fancy schmancy solvers. How does it work? You don't know. It's a big, complex system, and it gives you some solution. But you have no idea where the errors are. So you assume that a scenario, a constraint described, a family of test vectors. And what you'd like to do is to choose one of them for each test randomly and uniformly. Because if you, if you have to search somewhere, your best method is to search randomly and uniformly. Okay? 
And so otherwise, I will let the internals of the, of the solver influence where I'm looking for the bug. And it will be like looking under the, under the, uh, under the light. So this gives rise to a following, to me, very beautiful mathematical question. Given a Boolean formula, generate solutions uniformly at random, and do it in a scalable way. You want to do it for large industrial formulas. And uh, interesting, uh, in, in, uh, this is 10 years ago, there was a program on, on logic and uh, computational logic and computational logic and algorithm that Anu Janai organized in New York Institute. And we had a workshop with a speaker from IBM Research. And he described this pop. This was then, uh, then a bit newer than it is today. There was about 10 years old approach. And he described uh, this random constraint method. And I asked him, I said, OK, how do you generate solutions uniformly at random? He said, oh, we really don't know how to do it. We use all kind of hacks. That's what he told us at the time. And so I got very interested in the problem 10 years ago. It turns out that it has many applications. I talked about constraint random test generation. But if you want, just we heard a beautiful tutorial this morning about, uh, about this uh, rejection sampling, for example. So imagine that uh, the guess program we heard this morning just guess uniformly all the Boolean assignments. And the checker checks whether the assignment satisfies a given Boolean formula. Now, the idea is the solution space is incredibly sparse. So if you try to do naive rejection sampling, you will sample and sample and sample forever before you find a solution. So it's not a good method to do that. The question is, how do we actually do it? And this is what I refer to here as probabilistic inference. But there's a nice new application that I had recently, people who run MOOCs. And they have to give assignment, homework. And the homework will be taken by 100,000 students. And there are all these discussion forum. So if you give everybody the same problem, Somebody will post a solution on the web, and bang, everybody knows what the solution is. So you want to generate 100,000 different problems. How do you do that? And the answer is you write constraint to describe the parameter space, and you generate instances at random. And so you really generate 100,000 different problems. So the theoreticians have been looking at it since the, since like 30, from about for the starting about 30 years ago. And the, and they've solved the problem. What does it mean solve the problem? Two papers, first by Jerome Valle and Vazirani, but then an improvement by Belare, Goldrach, and Petran. And they show that you can, do, you, you can do uniform generation of NP witnesses in randomized p-time algorithm using an NP oracle. So problem solved. We know how to do Clearly, you cannot do better than using a, a, an NP oracle, because you have, you have to solve SAT. So in 2011, my students, Kuldeep Mill, uh, took my logic class and told me he's interested in a research project. I said, here is a good one. Implement the algorithm. So we implemented what we call the BGP algorithm. And we could get it to run for 16 variables. And then the question was, can we publish it? <laughs> and I said, Kuldeep, you know, 16 variables. Remember, at this point, people have all this whole problem with hundreds of thousands of variables. I said, if we send it even to a workshop, People will simply laugh at us. This, will, this paper will become a joke, 16 variables. And I, all I could say is, well, look at Javon's. He did four variables. We can do 16 variables. <laughs> so we had to go back to the, to the drawing. This was really very nice, because we had to go back and redo the theory so to get algorithms that we can implement efficiently. Now, we also look what people do in the industry. So there are two really methods to do it. One is to use a binary decision diagram, BDDs, which are kind of branching programs. And if you, have, if you are able to build a BDD for a formula, then you do essentially a random walk on the BDD. I won't get into details. And you can get a, a, a uniform uh, sampling. But we, BDDs can handle maybe up to at most about 1,000 variables. After that, the BDDs are just too large. So what do really people do in industry? There are two approaches. One based on MCMC, and we heard again a very nice theoretical framework for MCMC, how you can do that. Except that in, the, in general, this MCMC takes, you know, in this case, it takes exponential time to get to the stationary distributions. So it takes way too long. So you stop earlier, and then you really don't know what the, what's the quality of what you are getting. Or what people do really do in, in practice, they take solvers. In this, in, inside the solver, they stick all kind of randomization steps. And they hope that this will somehow uniform, uniformize the solution space. The answer is it doesn't. People run experiment, and you get actually very poor uniformity. You get, you get something, but you cannot say anything about it. And so we've been working now for the past uh, three years on a new framework. 
uh, called Unigen. By now, we have several versions of it. And it is similar to BGP in the sense that it's a randomized polynomial algorithm calling a SAT oracle, uh, NP oracle. What is NP oracle? It's a SAT oracle. So we have a program calling SAT as a black box. Not quite. I'll explain how it's different than pure SAT solver. And uh, what we get is almost uniform generation, which I'll explain. And the idea where we're using ideas that are, some are very old, universal hashing. Again, it's a 30-year-old idea, beautiful idea from theoretical computer science. And we're using very cutting edge SAT technology. It's called SMT solver. I'll mention, explain it in a minute. And today we can handle millions of variables. So we are able to handle I uh, industrial size uh, problems. So first of all, where do you compromise? You compromise on, on uh, uniformity. So if you have a solution space with kappa solution, then a uniform probability would be that every solution is chosen with probability 1 over kappa. And we have, this is a slightly different formulation, which has explained my questions earlier about uh, the variational privacy. Uh, this is essential. You, be, you have a, a tolerance of 1 plus epsilon, and you multiply the probability from above and below or divide by 1 plus epsilon. So if you take epsilon to be, let's say, 0.1, that means that you are within 10% of your uniform probability. And epsilon is a parameter here. You'll see, of course, as the smaller epsilon, you'll pay the price for it. So this is almost uniform. Now, what is the basic idea? So the basic idea goes back to, again to work by Cutter and Wegman and then, and then Sipser. And then it be, be used by, by, for example, the reduction from NP to UP use similar ideas. So these are not new ideas. You take the solution space and you divide it into roughly equal small cells. And then you choose a cell at random. And the cell are small and said a cell has a small number of solutions. So you can enumerate precisely the number of solutions in the cell. And then you choose randomly one among them. If the cells are roughly equal, then this would give you an almost uniform uh, distribution. Now, the difficult part is how do I take a set of solutions which I know nothing about? It's a mysterious set. All I can do is a SAT solver can tell me, can say it's empty or not empty. And how do I divide it into uniform cells? And here comes the magic of universal hashing. So hashing, of course, is a, one of the most fundamental ideas in computer science. In many, many applications, we need to, to map a very large set to a much, much smaller set. Okay? You have, uh, on your computer, think of it, you have all the, maybe every password is, I don't know, there must be some limit, maybe let's say 50 characters long, and you have to take the huge space, and you have to store it, and the only way to store it is to map it to a much smaller space. So generally, we map 0, 1 to the n for a large n to 0, 1 to the m for a much, much smaller m. So m is much smaller than n. Now, uh, if you go back to early papers on hashing, the discussion what is a good hash function? A good hash function takes a roughly random set of inputs and preserves the randomness. So if you start with a roughly, roughly random input space, you'll get a roughly random output space. But if you have a very bad initial distribution, there's no guarantee what will happen to the output space. And then came the idea of universal hash function. The idea is that because you don't know anything about the input distribution, you randomize over it. Right? This is a really one, a fundamental idea that probably comes from game theory, that if you know nothing, randomize. So you have a family of hash functions. You choose one fu hash function randomly, and that will guarantee that whatever was the initial distribution, the output distribution will be roughly uniform. It turns out that you need more than that, because one thing you could do, you choose a random output. And then you take all the inputs and, and map it, map all of them to this one random output, which you chose incredibly well. Of course, this will be very bad, because all these different inputs will not be met independently. And so you want some notion of independence. And how much independence depends on the application. And generally, people talk about R universal hash function. And R universal means that every R input values are mapped independently. And the higher they are, the more, the nicer thing you can say about the range, for example, the variance of the, of the distribution, not just the, the expectation, but also in higher moments. And the way to get R-wise universality is to use polynomial of degree R minus 1. So there is, you can do it, but in some, you have to use more and more expensive uh, tools to get higher independence. And this is a, a very critical issue, because higher universality means higher complexity. So BGP wrote a theoretical paper. So they went, why don't we do n universality, where n is the number of variables? 
So they had to use polynomials of, of, of high degree polynomials, but they got nice result. All the cells were small and they got uniform distribution. But this high degree polynomial, when you try to reduce them to SAT, gave us very, very complex formulas. And therefore, we could not, they remember, that's why we couldn't scale more than 16 variables. So what we had to go back is to show that you can actually work with three universality. Uh, I believe that this should be done with two universality. Just pairwise independent should be enough, but we've not been able to prove it yet. But with three universality, we can show that every a random cell is small with high probability. And that gives us almost uniform uh, generation. And that, that, by, that is the key idea that enables us to go, one key idea that enables us to go from tens of variables to by now millions of variables. And we get the statement, we get a running time we can say is similar to what BGP had, which is polynomial in the size of the formula in 1 over epsilon, of course, relative to a SAT oracle. Now, the sec the how do we actually build the hash function? So again, we're using ideas that have been, have been discussed before, and this is using random XOR constraints. So normally, we think that a, a clause is, is a in disjunction of variable. In this case, we take a, a in exclusive disjunction of variables. So we choose the variables with probability half. So every variable is either get in or not with probability half. And then the sum is chosen again to be 0 or 1 with probability half. So you can think of it as a linear equation modulo 2, where the, a variable gets in with probability half, and every, every clause has a roughly n over 2 variables. And I'll come back to this point. So the idea is we're taking the solution space, we're taking, think of it as a random hyperplane, and we split it essentially in two. And then we do it again and again and again and again. If we do it n times, we get two to the m cells, and the cells are going to be fairly large, fairly small. And of course, m has to be chosen very carefully. In fact, we don't know initially what is m, and part of the algorithm is to find out the, the right m. But as a result, what we get that every cell is now described by initial C and F clause, set of clauses plus XOR clauses. So we thought, OK, very easy to convert XOR clauses to standard clauses. Just use the tightening and coding. It's very easy to do. This turns out to be a terrible idea. In fact, even if you take, just take XOR constraint by themselves, they're just linear equations modulo 2. So you can solve them in polynomial time using Gaussian elimination. In fact, there are solvers that will do just that for you. But if you reduce them to CNF and you give them to such solver, it will perform terribly. It doesn't know that these are extra constraints. It will run the backtracking search, and it will run forever. And in particular, the combination of CNF and XOR is a nasty combination if you try to just to use a standard SAT solver. Now, here comes the other idea, which is the SMT solving. And so roughly starting around 2000, after, after people realized that SAT solvers are taking off, and people said, can we do more expressive constraints? Can we build on this success to handle Boolean plus other type of constraints, such as linear arithmetics and, and, um, and others? And there have been tremendous progress since 2000. And these are heavily used today. And we happen to stumble, really stumble, just pure luck. We stumble a, 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 upon an SMT solver called Crypto Minisat, developed by Matt Jesus and his colleagues. And they really were looking at combination of CNF and XOR constraints. And they wanted to use it to break cryptographic keys. Because cryptographic keys are bit vectors. So they thought if they can, they can somehow use SAT by itself does not work. You cannot break. You cannot do, uh, for example, uh, you cannot do primality testing or, or uh, factor numbers using SAT. They thought maybe if we add XOR, we can do it. It was a total failure. They put it away. The guy left academia, went to industry. But the solver was still there. And the solver is actually very effective on this combination because it combines SAT solving with Gaussian elimination in a, in a clever way. <coughs> so we have a tool now. And so one of the things, remember, it does almost uniform. So it's in, interesting to say, how, what is almost uniform? How uniform is almost uniform? So here is a, what, an experiment we ran on a problem with 16,000 solutions. We did about 4 million samples. And for each, for each solution, we counted how many times it had been selected. Can you briefly summarize how, how the sampler actually works? So you, you run, you, you compute the cells, and then you, you, you it, has two, it has two phases. One, there is a search of this magic parameter m. And m has to find roughly how many extra concerns do we need so we get a, a small cells, OK? And then we create this random, uh, this random XOR constraints. We 
put it with the formula, we give it to CryptoMinisat. CryptoMinisat uh, enumerate the solutions in a cell. It's a random cell. We count the solution. This is, has to be usually a few dozens of solutions. We choose one of them at random. Okay. But there is a part there, actually, the more in, there is a part there that one has to implement very carefully, which is how to find as efficiently as you can. It's a search algorithm. How to find the right number of, the right number of XOR constraints. Because if you put too many, the problems become too heavy. You cannot solve it. If you put too few, then you get cells that are too large. You have to find just the, the Goldilocks number of uh, extra constraints. So in this case, we counted how many times every solution is obtained. And this has to, in the limit, to give you a Poisson distribution. But instead of comparing to Poisson, we actually implemented a real uniform sampler specifically for this problem, since there are 16,000 solutions, and we know, we know them all. And, uh, these are the two plots of the counts of each solution, and these are stati statistically indistinguishable. So what's interesting is this is done, if we, ca if we make epsilon too small, we pay the price. So we took here epsilon to be about 0.75, and still we get something that looks very uniform to us. In terms of performance, we compare it to extra sample prime that came from uh, Cornell, which was a heuristic, some very important ideas, but it was still a heuristic uh, sampler which means it gave in particular, it gave no guarantee on uniformity. And now we, we, and we are able then to outperform it by two to three orders of magnitude. So we have a method now that, that does it, does this kind of almost uniform sampling, which gives you a guaranteed almost uniformity and performs um, almost ready to industrial applications. If you ask me at the break, I'll tell you what almost ready means. And this gives us the ambition to go back to counting. We've heard about counting before. And so, as again, if Dan said that policy databases are the assembly language of counting, then propositional model counting is the transistors of, uh, of logical counting. And except that uh, it's actually a hard problem. So SAT is still a hard problem. I'll talk more about what is SAT. But we know that in practice, we can solve today SAT for problems with millions of variables. But sharp SAT to count variables, to count solutions, we can scale up to maybe 50,000 variables, but not for bigger formulas. So, so whatever the, dif the theoretical difference, it's a much harder problem in practice. And again, it has many, many applications. We heard enough about it, so I will not talk about, about the applications of model counting here. Now, again, this problem has been studied by, by theoreticians. Again, this, the idea is actually to do what's called pack counting. So many people heard of pack learning, but pack came first in the context of counting, of approximate counting. You want probably approximately correct. They probably refer again to some tolerance, one plus epsilon, that you want to have. And in addition, it's a randomized algorithm, and you want a success probability to be uh, at least uh, delta. And again, Jerome Valley and Sinclair showed that this is in BPP to the NP, and there has been no implementation of these ideas. Until, uh, until we approached it. And actually, if the initial ideas were implemented, they would not work for the same reason that uh, the BGP algorithm did not work. I mean, they were not ready for actual implementation. But it turns out that the idea of universal hashing works effectively here. Because once we have a small cell, we can count the, precisely the solutions in a cell, multiply by 2 to the m, and we get an estimate. Now, it's just an estimate. If you run it, if you sample enough time, you can get and take the median or the average, it doesn't, doesn't matter. You can get an estimate to desired level of confidence. Okay, so the question is how many times you need to sample? And the answer is it's, it's polynomial in, uh, in log of 1 minus delta in this case. So we were able to compare it on places where we have the ground truth, so to speak. So this is a problem with at most 50,000 variables. And we compare it to what was at the time the set of the art uh, counter, cache. And what was interesting is that even though we use epsilon 0.75, on all the problem up to that the cache was able to solve, our accuracy was always within 4%. So, so the method actually is much more effective even than we can prove analytically. And again, it outperforms a, a cache dramatically. Cache usually can handle, as, as I say, if cache does not normally stop in five minutes, you might as well give up. It will never stop. But we can help problem with hundreds of thousands of variables. So one issue that comes up, we have long extra clauses. On the average, I have n over 2. And this has been the people have tried now very hard for the last few years to see, can we 
use much shorter XOR clauses because they will give you improvement in performance. And uh, there are various combinatorial lemmas that argue why short XOR clauses should be good enough. But it turns out to connect, to, to tie all the threads together, which is to prove combinatorial lemma, to have an algorithm with provable properties, and implement this algorithm with no magical number, so to speak, so an honest implementation experiments does, does not require extrajudicial uh, uh, involvement from the experimenter, it's actually quite hard to do. And I think the, the jury is out whether we can use short XOR clauses. I have seen nothing yet that says that it actually probably uh, works. I want to finish with some kind of a bit of a philosophical uh, uh, thinking about this. So I think one of the things I'm trying to communicate is that, that something amazing happened. I said, I really don't deserve any credit for it. This is all the work on SAT is the work of other people. I was deeply skeptical when I heard the initial papers. But uh, today, I think we have um, such amazing progress. This deserves better publicity. And partly, I think, is better terminology. I think SAT solving is for, for us, for the, for the general public, deep solving. <laughs> and the other thing I show you that once you have something like that, you have a big hammer. If you have a big hammer, look for nails. What else can we do with it? I give you one example here, which is sampling and counting. But what else can we do? And I have to say, we should not assume that scalability is not a challenge anymore. People continue to work on SAT solver to make them more scalable. And we are continuing to work on approximate sampling and counting to make them more scalable. There are still challenges. But I think this result really should force us to go and uh, rethink some of our very basic assumptions about theory and practice in computer science. So when I was a freshman student, one of the, of the graduate TAs asked us, what is the difference between theory and practice? And none of us had a good answer. And he says, well, in theory, they're very, they're very similar. But in practice, they're very different. And so I think this was very sage advice. So P versus NP is, of course, a, a beautiful mathematical question. We can talk a lot about it. But if we solve it either way, it's not clear that it will really have any practical impact. Because you could prove that P equal NP, but the polynomial will be n to the 1,000. In fact, it doesn't even have to be n to the 1,000. Even the polynomial of degree n to the 10 make the algorithm really impractical. Think about it. Take n to the 10, <coughs> take uh, n equal uh, 100, and that's it. You're done. Or we could prove that P is different than NP, but all of NP may be included in n to the log 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 n. And this is, this is maybe even as good as any polynomial. And so there's no guarantee that solving PVS and P will need any practical benefits. Now, when I was a graduate student, that was considered a scary problem. You know, you, you look at it like this. You approach it like a, like a bomb, right? You look at it very carefully. You approach it with a, after you wear, wore a vest. And start, you know, I'm not trying to say that SAT is an easy problem, because we know how to generate very difficult SAT instances. Okay? We can generate SAT instances with a few hundred variables that no solver can solve. But nevertheless, there's something magical about the problem that come up in real life. Nobody understands why, but we're able to solve huge problems. And just explaining it, I think, is a, is a wonderful challenge. Okay? How can we explain why some problems in SAT are so easy? and why, and some are so, are so hard. And, but on the other side, is, this is for the theory. How can we leverage the fact that in the real life, many sad instances seem to be very easy? What else can we do with it? Okay? Should we think of BPP to the NP as the new P time? Thank you very much. It's a comment more than a question. The comment is that I don't really know why you say that these are evolutions of the theoretical algorithms because they really look the same to me. Say again? They really look the same to me. What looks the same to you? Your algorithm as the theoretical one. They use pairwise independence, the theoretical ones as well. And I have to say, if you look at Arora Barak, for example, the book, the textbook on complexity theory, Arora and Barak, they have exactly this same schema for approximate counting. So no, I, I actually, I said that uh, these, are, these, are all, these are not new algorithms. These are just, in some sense, refinement of old algorithms. But partly you have to do and refine the analysis to show you have to use a particular hash functions. And you have to prove that this hash function have this pro is probability properties that you need. And then part of the thing is that uh, don't assume just because you have an algorithm, the implement implementation does not matter. Implementation matters a lot. So, so this was, to me, an idea of taking the old theory and 
implementing it, see that it doesn't work, and then kind of redoing it in a way to get to something that does work. So it is clearly, I'm, I'm not trying to say, these are all, all set of old ideas, yeah. To, ask, to answer your question, to some extent, using crypto minisat is actually the really important part, that you don't take the XORs and try to convert them to clauses and solve them closely. That actually buys you a lot. I would say is, you know, the, there is, if you look at the paper, you will see there is, I mean, mostly is a kind of closing all the threads, proving that the hash function have the desired universality properties, proving probably of the algorithm, because we want to have an algorithm in which we can say it, it converts in a certain amount of time. You have, to, you have to search for the right number of extra constraints. It's actually a non-trivial part of the algorithm. So there is a theory there that I would say I would not call it a, uh, it's not completely new. It's really taking a whole bunch of ideas and really work them to do it. And then there is algorithmic engineering part to make everything work. Your conclusion uh, that we need a richer and broader complexity theory explaining us what is really difficult, what is really hard. I mean, I've heard that one also a very long time ago. Already, and not, in fact, not just uh, apply to SAT, but apply to undecidable problems, in fact, that we also routinely solve in, in practice. So why is this problem so hard? You posted 20 years ago also in, in some of your talks. But there's uh, I don't no think I, I, we can go back to my talk from 20 years ago. <laughs> I would say is we can t I've been talking about it now because they've been the same. You, we can look at the last 10 years. We see progress, for example, in, in uh, program termination. So it's even worse, right? It's an undecidable problem. And they don't, they don't seem to be so much difficult in practice. In each case, there seems to be something in this problem that arises in real life that makes them easier. I actually understand it better for program termination than I understand it here. Because program termination, when I write a program and it terminates or does not terminate, it is not due to some deep mathematical reason. If it terminates, it's because of usually fairly simple reasoning. And if it does not terminate, it's usually due to some stupid reason. So it's not as if my termination of my program depends on external Riemann hypothesis, okay? It is a very, there is very simple reason for either termination or non-termination, because none of us thinks when you write a program on an incredibly, incredibly complicated termination argument. And so there's a psychological reason as to why this termination problem in real life are actually fairly easy. I do not quite understand why these complex circuits that come from Intel are easy. That I do not understand, okay? Yeah. In solving instances, as you say, with hundreds of thousands of, of, of variables, how important is the role of backbones and uh, backdoor sets? So um, I would say it, depend, it depends on the CD cell solvers. So, so one of the things, there is a lot of work now, people trying to explain, find explanation. Find structure in this formula will explain why they are so easy. People have looked at backbones. Does not seem when to be a good explanation. SMC fails on formulas with hmm? I've used it, it fails at 300 variables. Say it again? I have used oh, yeah. XMC, and yeah. it oftentimes fails on, variable, on formulas with 300 variables. Right. But you say it works for tens or hundreds of thousands of variables. So there is some discrepancy there, and I'm trying to understand what feature of those formulas is it that enables the algorithm. So, I mean, one thing about your formula, I would say, is if you have such formulas, first of all, let's try. It will be actually yeah. interesting. I know, but there are, there are some formulas, such all of fail on them. No. Okay. Such all work yeah. on them. Yeah. So, I mean, look, part of the issue is that we really, you know, we are starting to investigate. You've seen some of our work. We're trying to understand what happens when you take problems and you end random extra constraints. So, but the initial argument was such solver works nicely on industrial formula. The, fo the formula we are, uh, we are generating here are not purely industrial formulas because they're industrial formulas plus random extra constraints. What does it do? So we're only now starting to investigate what happens when you take such formula and you combine CNF and XO. We're only at the beginning of this, on in, in, in this investigation. And so I said, I, the answer to most questions that you're going to ask, I said, beats me. All right, we'll have one more question, so Vikash. So, uh, so maybe quite naive, but I'm wondering, Have you seen any fruitful, smooth analysis of this type of problem <coughs> as a step towards getting at the gap between the formal settings, which give us this grim picture, and this mysterious real-world problem generators? So people always ask me these questions, and it implies the smooth analysis explain 
for example, why linear programming problems, why simplex, not just linear, why simplex seem to work so well on linear, problem, linear programming problems. My understanding of, of, smooth, of smooth analysis, it talks about the robustness of solving. It does not explain why if you just take a problem, de novo, you put it, you run it, you run simplex on it. It's a huge problem, has million, many millions of variables. The matrix can be sent a million by million. It's sparse, and simplex finishes in a reasonable amount of time. I don't see a smooth analysis, analysis explain that. So I don't quite know, you know, if the goal is to explain why we're solving problems. Well, the idea is yeah. I measure the coefficients from the real world, yeah. for example. There's measurement noise. So, so that smooth analysis is explains well that this measurement noise is not so important. Okay? The problem here, this is a very discrete problem. I've tried very hard to find some analog. And I would, if you have great ideas, I would, it would be wonderful. I couldn't find what is the, the, the analogous idea, uh -huh. because these are very discrete issue, discrete right. problem. And we know that you take this formula, you change, you flip one variable, that's it. It will go from sat to unsat. Okay? They're, 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 they're not robust. They don't have the robustness that you have in linear programming. So it will be, I think it's a, it's a I have, I've thought myself about this question. Many people ask me, and my answer is I have no idea how to even apply this approach. 